Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Kate Kinslow. I'm the executive director uh, at Pennsylvania Hospital, which is one of the hospitals that is part of the University of Pennsylvania. And it really is uh, a great pleasure for me today to come and be part of the conference. And I trust and hope that you're all having a wonderful time and is getting as much out of the uh, wonderful lectures as I have been. I particularly want to thank Dr. Melise, and many of you have heard through uh, out the, the uh, lectures how persistent she is and how wonderful and what a great mentor. And we all know that, and uh, we do thank her for her mentorship, and I uh, particularly want to thank her for allowing me to be part of this. But I have to say that her mentorship spills over into her office as well, <laughs> because all of the wonderful people that I've had the privilege over the last um, two years, actually, working on the uh, conference and the content and bringing many people from various continents together uh, are due to the work of not only Dr. Melise, but to the people in her office. And I know many of you are in the room, and I would ask you to stand up so that we can congratulate you for the hard work that you have done in making such a great event for all of us. I just have a little bit of um, housekeeping. The, at your table, you will see several forms. There is the evaluation form for the keynote, for the plenary session, uh, so don't just think it's the same, please. And then there is a TAN form that has the highlights of the plenary session. You will also see a yellow form at your tables, and this is extremely important. Uh, what we would like you to do is to suggest three action steps that you can immediately take back into the community. You can hand this in or, or leave it at your table as you go out the door or you, you know, uh, or you can give it to anyone that is in the room that is on the planning committee. So there's three things you can do. Either leave it on your table, hand it in as you're walking out the door, or give it to anyone on the planning committee. But it's really very important because it's wonderful that we had the opportunity to gain such um, intimate knowledge of the issues that are facing women in globalization, but we now need to turn that into action. So please don't forget to do that uh, because we will then take your information and start to implement and use it. So the theme of today's conference is uh, the focusing the public lens on health on women's lifestyles. Uh, and over the last couple of days, we have heard uh, many lectures and listen to interesting topics and research papers on the effect of urbanization on women's health. We have had the opportunity, I am sure, to meet people from uh, various countries and continents, to rebond with past acquaintances, and to meet new friends. And that networking possibility is always one of the wonderful things that helps us as we go to events such as this. We have heard over the last several days multiple statistics. We have evaluated the issues on global health problems, defined the challenges for women in cities, and explored solutions for healthier lifestyles, empowerment for women, and access to education, housing, and health care. During the course of this conference, we have seen the effect of gender inequality that has been demonstrated through maternal child issues, domestic violence, the profound effects of poverty, the lack of access to health care, sanitation, clean water, and, self -house and safe housing. Women, as we all know, have been defined as the caregivers not only of the family, but of the community as well. And it has been demonstrated that if we care for the mother, that this will have multiple ripple effects, not only for the immediate family, but into the community at large. And it has been demonstrated here throughout the last several days that if this phenomenon can be realized within our world, it will help shift the focus of women's health to a central global issue not just a marginal category that has been relegated to the sidelines. As all of you know, women and children are the most vulnerable individuals affected by urban crowding, lack of sanitation, 
access to health care, and limited education. Physical and social conditions that lower socioeconomic women in urban areas face increase their risk of exposure to carcinogens, pollutants, violence, mental illness, and most particularly that of depression. Poverty and lack of education often leads to for po for poor food choices and subsequent obesity. Other chronic conditions such as heart disease and high blood pressure, pressure affect this population as well. AIDS and HIV we have seen are major health issues that face a large portion of the female population. And as we heard from Ambassador Revere, it is the leading cause of death for women in the ages of 15 to 45 worldwide. Lack of proper medication, nutrition, and social support often leads to premature death with resultant orphan children. Close living conditions with concomitant lack of privacy and urban violent undertones expose women and girls to sexual violence and unplanned pregnancies, leaving this vulnerable population further disadvantaged. The works presented by the many scholars over the past days have given us all, I truly hope, a renewed energy to act as agents of change in working to empower women worldwide through sustainable plans for improvement of their social, economic, and cultural environments. To foster the work of society to provide to all people education, appropriate infrastructures for wholesome living, and supports for mental health and economic sustenance. It is when we all come together, male as well as female, to understand that half of our population cannot be left behind, that we will move our global community to one that can thrive and grow competitively, meeting the future challenges of greater urbanization. It is now with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Nancy Fugate Woods, who is the keynote speaker, uh, introducer for our keynote speaker. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Woods is uh, the professor of the Department of Family and Child Nursing and the Dean Emeritus of the University of Washington School of Nursing. She has many honors and she has written and researched extensively on life and health experiences throughout the life cycle in women. She has served on numerous committees and in societies and has also received multiple honors and degrees. She has received uh, an honor doctoral degree from the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Hoffa, and Chiang Mai University in Thailand. She earned a BS in nursing from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire in 1968, and an MN from the University of Washington in 1969, and a PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 1978. So with that, I introduce to you Dr. Nancy Woods. Thank you very much. For those of you who have, you know, the dreams about um, events that you weren't prepared for, I sat here and thought, oh, goodness. <laughs> this is really the, um, the nightmare of all times, not having prepared the keynote speech. Fortunately for you and for me, we have with us uh, Dr. Vivian Pin, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce her. Um, Dr. Vivian Pin is the first full-time director of the Office of Research on Women's Health at the National Institutes of Health, an appointment that she has held since 1991. In February 1994, she was also named Associate Director for Research on Women's Health in the Office of the Director of the NIH. Dr. Pin came to the NIH from Howard University College of Medicine in Washington, D.C., where she had been professor and chair of the Department of Pathology since 1982. And she had previously held appointments at Tufts University School of Medicine and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Pinn has long been active in efforts to improve the health and the career opportunities for women, and in particular, for underrepresented ethnic groups. She has been invited to present the ORWHS mandate 
programs and initiatives to many national and international audiences, especially those with an interest in improving women's health throughout the world. One of her primary areas of attention has been to raise the perception of the scientific community about the importance of sex and gender factors in basic and clinical research and their implications for women's health care. Uh, Vivian has single-handedly arm-wrestled uh, most of the NIH directors um, and uh, each year, a new, um, a new set of them almost, into paying attention to areas in which their research agenda should really focus on the health of women and has done an incredible job of that. Um, she has nearly completed the third initiative, which is to set the agenda of priorities for women's health research. Um, this is an agenda setting process that is unique and um, particularly well done in that um, since she joined the Office of Research and Women's Health Research as its director, Vivian has reached out <clears throat> to advocacy groups, uh, to clinicians, to researchers, to members of the public alike, and having been involved in uh, two of the agenda setting efforts that she led, um, I can vouch for the importance of hearing the diversity of opinion and the diversity of perspectives that have been represented there. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Pin also is currently co-chair, along with the director of the NIH, of the NIH Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers. Um, she has taken unusual interest and made a large commitment to advancing um, the status of women as scientists and looked uh, along with members of uh, many national organizations um, devoted to the advancement of science, looked at ways in which we can facilitate women committing to and staying in careers in science, as well as some of the obstacles that keep us from doing that work. Dr. Pin is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 1995. Now, there's a very long list of honors, but I picked a few of these that I think are particularly poignant. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Pinn received the Catherine McFarland Award from the University of Pennsylvania for Distinguished Service in Women's Health in 2000. In addition, the National Organization on Women honored Dr. Pinn for her leadership and her contributions to women's health, an unusual award and one that I think is particularly important. And finally, and recently, um, Dr. Pin received the, the Women Who Dare Award from the Black, Women Health, Black Women's Health Imperatives 25th Anniversary Celebration in Washington, D.C. So she is well recognized, not only among the professional circles, but probably more importantly, by groups of women from across this nation who are grateful to her for her service and leadership and advancing women's health research. And it is my delight to introduce Dr. Vivian Pin. Thank you, Nancy, for that gracious introduction. And actually, I was breathing a sigh of relief if I thought you were going to be doing the keynote. <laughs> But I should also say that, uh, that Nancy was one of our keynote speakers at one of our strategic planning events where I asked her to speak about uh, the health of women and the effects of urbanization. So in fact, I've gotten great leadership uh, and inspiration from the work and her assistance, especially since she was one of our charter members of our advisory committee. And of course, I could go on the whole rest of this time praising Dr. Melise, who, uh, as has already been stated, no one can say no to, who sets a great example in her energy and enthusiasm, and just her spirit just serves as an inspiration to all of us to keep going and to, to give attention to those areas that she feels are important, because if she didn't, if she thinks so, they really must be. So I want to thank you for inviting me, including me in this, uh, in this wonderful uh, Congress, and, uh, and thank you for the inspiration that you provide to so many of us 
not only nationally but in the international sphere. It's just wonderful. And I was asked to speak to you today about women's health in the urban community from the NIH perspective, and that is the perspective that I want to advance to you. Now, as you've heard, I'm director of the Office of Research on Women's Health, which was actually established almost 20 years ago in September 1990. And just a quick summary of what our office does, it was really set up initially to respond to advocacy and congressional concerns about the lack of inclusion of women in biomedical research studies funded by the NIH. And of course, the office was set up with the assurance by the then acting director of NIH that this office would make sure that women would not be excluded from clinical studies funded by the NIH in the future. Well, you can't just say put women into studies. That wouldn't be scientific. So obviously, one of the initial things that was developed for our office was that we would need to help set priorities for research uh, and to indicate what are the kinds of studies that we need to be doing to study women's health, and especially since since the concern was about studying conditions that affect both men and women and men only and applying those results to women as though women were the same to really look at where we needed sex and gender comparison studies. And so that really was, has been sort of our major thrust while we have in fact implemented, uh, implemented policies for the inclusion of women in clinical studies. You can't just study women and put women in studies and talk about what their health issues are without thinking about the role of women in decision making, policy making, carrying out that research. So another bubble, if you will, in our cartoon of our major responsibilities has to do with women in biomedical careers. And then noticing and paying attention to the fact that all women are not the same, looking at those factors that influence or affect differences in health status health outcomes and responses to interventions among different populations of women. And I can tell you after Dr. Malise got on us and had us participate earlier at the conference, I guess it was five years ago, you can see that that bubble in giving its examples of some of the factors that lead to differences, the health status of women for our office and for the NIH now also includes looking at differences at the factors of living in an urban area or a rural area and how that may influence health. So you have made a difference in how we are presenting presenting in the, if you will, because this, I think this, this cartoon pretty much represents what we do in our office and, of course, um, uh, and for our initiatives at the NIH. And, of course, we have areas uh, where we've been focusing on interdisciplinary research, but I'm not going to talk much about that today. So as we think about women's health, and I want to point this out because even looking at some of the quotes you've had on the screen and from some of the other talks and from some of the things that I'll be discussing with you, we know that one of the first things we did in addressing women's health research was to focus on the fact that we need to look at women beyond the reproductive years and really consider the, the lifespan issues of girls, adolescents, women, elderly women, and if you will, from the preconceptual time uh, of the health of women as well as the interuterine environment and then taking it through. So, so that focus on women's health in the context of the lifespan has been central, and I think it's extremely important in the context of the focus of this this conference and what you are discussing, and I was pleased to see that, that that has been brought up in many areas and in some of the recommendations I'll be showing to you. And just briefly before I move into perhaps uh, as sort of to put the context in which we work and, and in which my comments are coming, as I think about this continuum of women's health from when we first started addressing it, very, I won't say naively, but very, very, the very beginnings of the most recent uh, women's health movement when NIH and the federal government got involved, and I have to say the most recent because when I've got Judy Norsigen sitting over here to my right and knowing that she's been doing women's health for many, many years and one of the first to really begin to focus on women's health as something that women as well as men needed to recognize, uh, I like to think about what we're doing now in terms of clinical research as really building on the foundation that people like Judy and others uh, really established for us in this country uh, and that really helped lead to the development of a federal focus, a government focus, if you will, on women's health. And we've sort of gone from the building on the lifespan concept to the sex and gender comparisons to looking at those disparities among different populations to building in the interdisciplinary aspects and then, of course, incorporating not only 
career building for women who might do women's health research, but even if they're not doing women's health research, they have roles in public health and administration and health care. Uh, but also knowing that we need both men and women to carry out research and to help advance the results of research than to career development for both women and men uh, as women's health researchers. Now, Dr. Wood mentioned to you about our agenda setting process and that we have done two and are in the midst of our third. And it's from that that I'm going to be drawing most of my comments to you this morning. It is true that one of the first things that this office did, in fact, Dr. Ruth Kirstein, who actually set this office up in 1990, uh, had planned a meeting to set the first research agenda, including a public hearing, and we've continued that model since that time. But that meeting was held at a place called Hunt Valley, Maryland. And so for that reason, you hear people referring to the Hunt Valley report, the report from that meeting. But it was the first national agenda for research on women's health in this country. Looking back, I think it was a great start and a great approach, but we knew we needed to go beyond those initial thoughts when we were all sort of very young and looking at focusing research on women's health across the lifespan. And so in, in ten, about 10 years later, we started on our second research agenda, which we called the Second National Agenda on Research on Women's Health, and published that in about 2000. Uh, and with this, we had meetings across the country, public hearings and working group discussions, and ended up with eight volumes. We had a volume from each of the meetings, all of the public hearing presentations were put into volumes and published. We had a summary volume, then we had a lay version volume, and then we had a Spanish uh, um, translation of that. Uh, and with all of that, eight volumes, I, not only do they look pretty with the colors, let me tell you, there's a lot of good information in there, which I really enjoy and find useful even today, even 10 years later, although some people get turned off by seeing eight volumes. I can tell you that we won't have that many with our ongoing process now, just to satisfy those who would prefer to reach for a small document, but there is a wealth of information in that. So anyway, here we are today, and then where are we going if we move forward? Since we've done these research agendas, how do we boil it down? Well, we've learned to get away from just specific diseases if we're really going to be directing national and international focus on women's health and careers. And so we really have sort of overarching themes and giving specific emphasis for women's health to prevention and treatment, as well as the biological and behavioral bases of sex and gender differences, which to me are also extremely important in terms of looking at the effects of urbanization on women and women's health within their environment. And looking at, of course, other areas of research interest, but I think the special emphasis areas are of great importance. One of the things about women's health research that I think has really come to bear and that has been extremely important is that I think at least within the NIH, it sort of began the focus, uh, the shifting of a focus from just looking at the biological model, just looking at the genetic basis, just looking at, at our genes and our biology to recognizing that if you're going to study women's health and understand about women's health, you've got to look at other factors that affect the health of women. I think these are important for men's health too, but it really took the movement for women's health to really bring these into focus in terms of how we design our research, what we think is important. And I'm sure all of this has been addressed in various ways by those who have spoken here about their efforts. We have to look at behavior. We have to look at social and societal factors. We have to look at the role of the community and of the family. We have to look at culture and race and ethnicity. What about environment? What about geographic location? Of course, that would include not only some of the toxic things that may be in the environment, but also where women live. Is it urban? Is it rural? Is it in suburbs? Uh, uh, and how does that relate to health and health, not only participation in research, but benefiting from the results of research? How we relate to our bodies and to our identity as women? occupational factors, and occupational factors meaning not just out in industry or in other areas, but within the home, we can still consider those occupational factors. What about access to medical care services and effects of poverty? And as Dr. Kincaid, I think that I say that right, pointed out earlier, one of our public mottos that we use in our office when we're giving public talks is that we see women 
as a portal to family and community health. So if we think about women as a portal to family and community health because they play such important roles in the health of their own families and their communities, all of these factors are important, not just for women, but for their families and communities. Well, I indicated the office was established in 1990, and you know that this is the year 2010. So actually this year, in fact, in September, we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Office of Research on Women's Health. So it's time for us again, it seems we just completed the last agenda setting process, but it's time for us to again take stock on where we should be going. And I've sort of put this out there by saying, we don't wanna just look at what we have now. We want to think about where should women's health be 10 years from now. And if you think about it in terms of not just the same old thing, where should it be? Then think about how do we get there in terms of research, in terms of designing research, in terms of utilizing new developments of science. So this is where we are in terms of strategic planning for what must come next. And my staff came up with the title, which I really like, which is moving into the future, showing there's action. We're continuing to act, we're continuing to move forward, but we want new dimensions, and we keep saying we want innovative strategies, new strategies, we don't want just the same old thing because we still have a lot to do, and how can we better accomplish it in terms of the NIH? Well, I, in some of my talks, kept talking about we need to do out of the box thinking. Oh, let's get out of the box. So somebody designed for me this beautiful box. I can put it on the slide to show that we're looking for the future of women's health research to really come out of the proverbial box. And how do we consider the future of women's health research and career development in terms of the health of women, the health of their families, the health of their communities, and if you will, the health of their nations. And I've asked that we consider this in the strategic planning process, this thought process. What progress have we made? Have we, how, how far have we come? Have we accomplished anything over recent years? But think about the coming years. What are gonna be some of the major health concerns we will be facing? What are some of the, the new technologies or emerging diseases and conditions or emerging things that we feel will be affecting the health of women and their families in, in future years for the next 10 years? And I don't know if futuristic is really a word, spell check didn't eliminate it, but it sounded like what I wanted to say. We really wanted to think about the future, so I put futuristic. I hope it really exists. I didn't go to the dictionary to look it up just in case it wasn't there. But also thinking about whether or not there are new paradigms. Can we, I really hesitate to use that word paradigm, but I couldn't think of a better one. Is there a new way, a new model, a new approach to what we're doing that will really take us forward? And of course, what should then be the role of our office and the NIH in addressing and ensuring that we're taking these new approaches to the future of women's health? Well, I like the light bulb, and I had drawn a light bulb, and one of the members of my staff told me I was obviously old and way behind because everybody wasn't using these kind of light bulbs anymore. But it makes a, it makes a nice, but then I reminded her, for some of us who are getting older, we need more light, so we need those old bulbs. But in any case, they also had this drawn for me, so I use what they come up with to show that, because I think we all are used to the idea of a light bulb in the comic strips projecting new ideas or the thought process. And I came up with, are we being anticipatory? In other words, we don't want to, and I'm sure you don't want to. We, we're where we are today, and you can talk about the status, and I'm gonna give you a few figures related to the status of women in, in urban communities, and I'm sure you've heard it from Rosalie and others who present it. But what we want to do, and I'm sure what you want to do, is not just talk about where we are, but where we should be five years, 10 years, 15 years in the future, and then give our thought processes today to how to get to where we should be tomorrow being innovative, being strategic. And of course, they did do another box for me. I like this with the woman. But trailblazing, again, I think it reemphasizes what I think our concerns are as we look at what are the scientific issues, what are the new technologies, what are emerging diseases, what are those futuristic strategies that we should advance over the next 10 years. So to do this and to get the ideas, because we face this every day, and I don't want just this uh, incestuous thinking of our office again. We've gone out to the public, to advocates, to scientists, to healthcare providers from all disciplines, all specialties, to help us. And we've had a series of five meetings, 
first one at Washington University in St. Louis, second one was at University of California, San Francisco, third one was at Providence, Rhode Island, where we addressed lifespan issues, uh, the fourth one was in Chicago at Northwestern, and our fifth one was at uh, Emory University in Atlanta just a month ago, two months ago, where we focused specifically on cardiovascular disease, since it was the lack of women in cardiovascular studies that really sort of gave rise. So we had one meeting specifically on that, but it, they'll all be, re I won't say reduced, will all be incorporated into an overall general comprehensive plan. Out of these meetings, and I've sort of looked at what the recommendations are, they've not been finalized, but there are two particular working groups that I want to, to just give you some idea of what some of the recommendations and thoughts were in terms of their advice to us thinking about a research agenda for the federal government to fund uh, related to women's health. Obviously, as you saw on that cartoon, we have added to our understudied, underrepresented populations, women from rural or, uh, urban or rural populations. Thank you, Dr. Belize and Dr. Wood. We have that incorporated. So we had a working group to specifically look at these issues. We divided these different populations up among different working groups. And this was at our Chicago meeting. And then at our UC San Francisco meeting, we had a working group looking specifically at global health. And I'm going to pull some of that to tell you about uh, what some of the recommendations are as I thought about what I could say to you because you all are the ones who are really doing the work. I'm, I can't believe I, for medicine I'm doing administration. I thought my time as a government administrator would last two or three years. It has been 19 years. I think it's time to move on, but 19 years I've been doing this and continue because it has just been so exciting. I must say, I think the first 15 years went by so fast, and then I realized how long I'd been there. Uh, but, but being involved in setting policy, funding research studies, and doing what we can to develop programs to enhance women's health, uh, as well as to enhance careers, has been, been very beneficial, and I hope we've got a whole new generation coming. But that doesn't keep me from understanding that while I'm at the NIH talking about this and doing this, many of you are out there actually doing the work. You're in the environment. You're doing it. And for that, I must admire your efforts. But it seemed very timely to address these issues. Why? Well, first of all, we know that this administration, the Obama administration, uh, has been very involved and very uh, supportive of global health. And you've already had Doc, um, um, uh, the ambassador at large, State Department speak, and I'm sure she talked about these women and girls-centered approaches. So we've got it at the highest levels of government. And then, of course, Rosalie in the Office of Global Health, I'm sure she talked about that office and its perspective, and then coming down to the agency level, our new director of the NIH, Dr. Francis Collins, when he came in and announced his five major areas of priority for the NIH for its research funding, mentioned among the four others, his fifth was global health. So when you've got the, the president and the president's administration, you've got the secretary in the department, you've got the director of NIH saying that global health is important, then you're going to pay attention to it and you're going to feel that you've got the support to do that. And of course, within the NIH, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that we have the Fogarty International Center, which is the center that focuses on international research, international career development. All, of course, all of the other institutes and centers have fund research in other countries and have international aspects, but it's the Fogarty Center that that really focuses primarily on global health. And you can see represented on the screen two of their brochures. One, their strategic plan for advancing science or advancing science for global health uh, for the NIH. Well, I'm sure you've heard all the figures and all of this, so I'm going to go through this just briefly, but setting the context in which our recommendations for where research should take us or what research should address. I want to say just a little bit about the urban community and women's health, and I'm sure you all either help generate these statistics or can quote them with your eyes closed, but it, it doesn't hurt to reiterate them. Looking at the increase or the, the fast pace of urbanization around the world, and that figure that three million people per, per week are moving to cities in the developing world, that is really an impressive figure, and the fact that many of them will be women. And of course, with this rapid increase in urbanization, and it's not just in low-income settings, we can see it even in this country and even some higher-income neighborhoods when you get a rapid influx of individuals 
increase, it's often difficult for a government to keep up with providing the basic amenities and the other, other, uh, other necessities that are needed to keep or to maintain health and to maintain living at the standards that we would like to see. I'm sure you've seen this chart, but this is the world urbanization from the World Urbanization Prospects, just looking at for developed countries and less developed countries with the projections for the future. And you can see the trend continues to be upward in terms of urban growth. And this world map, I really am fascinated by this world map, and I'm sure you've seen it for different areas. But if you look at areas with the fastest areas of urban growth, China and India stand out, and you can compare it. The size of the country or the size of the nation sort of reflects the, the pace of growth. But looking at the incidence of slums, uh, and of course, as we talk about urbanization, increased population, we know that we're going to see development of slums. That was referred to in the early remarks, even of this session, and I know you're familiar with it. But I just thought it'd be interesting also to contrast scientific productivity and sort of the, if you just look at the urban growth and then look at scientific productivity. That could be another whole talk in itself, so I won't say more. But it's, it's just striking to see that. And then thinking about women, and most of the households, about a third, not most, but about a third of the households in these areas referred to as slums, let's say overly populated areas uh, of urban areas, are households headed by women. And then if you think about the effects on women and their families and their communities, uh, certainly the lack of access to water and sanitation, the overcrowding, n housing issues, insecure tenure, will I be able to stay here, will I have a job, will I have an income, uh, are just very important. And we know that looking at women, uh, um, poor women, lower paying jobs, higher illiteracy rates with a lower education, the whole issue of intimate partner violence or violence for women in the urban areas, extremely important consideration, not a very inspiring one, but a very important one because we know that we see an increase in violence against women in the urban areas uh, and looking at many of those factors that come in. Now one would think, and certainly in general would think, that, uh, that health would be better in an urban setting uh, than in rural areas because you should have better access to health services and better access to water, clean water and sanitation. But we know that in looking at the data, if you use average data without disaggregation, it will appear better, but the, the wide range for the urban poor, and especially for urban poor women, reflects that there are so many women in the urban area who don't have the access, don't have the benefits uh, of the, of the so-called um, uh, positive aspects of urbanization. And of course, thinking about housing, another aspect, and the importance, and I think, again, this is where in thinking about women's health, we can't get away from all these other factors like occupation, like housing, and like the environment uh, that are very important. And so, so, and of course, reproductive health, and I'm sure you've had discussions, and we'll talk more about this, but just looking at the areas of reproductive health that really stand out if we look at the effects of urbanization on, on women's health. Uh, and, uh, and especially women's reproductive health. And you would think being in an urban area that women would have better access to health information, but there are data that suggest that in fact that is not the case. Poor urban women compared to non-poor urban women have higher levels of unmet need for contraception, lower levels of contraception use, higher levels of unintended pregnancies, and of course at a higher risk for sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV AIDS. And of course, again, that emphasis on intimate partner violence, which we can't get away from. It is something we need to focus on in this country, something we need to focus on around the world. Um, and then, of course, look, when we're talking about social determinants of women's health in the urban environment, we all recognize that the urban setting itself is a social determinant of health and that gender inequality is also another powerful social determinant of health. And of course, looking at the urban area and thinking about women and women's health, we know that, uh, that, uh, that we're seeing an increase in the number or percent of older women in our population in general. And of course, in most societies, women form the greatest 
population or proportion of older women. And so that brings into play other considerations. And going back to something that was discussed earlier, um, earlier today and earlier in this session, but also that I referred to earlier, we think about women as a portal to family and community health, but also because they are also major caregivers caregivers for the elderly, as we're seeing an increase in the number of elderly women. But women are not always, we don't have that, that niche, that family unit like we used to see when, when you're isolated in, an urban, in, a, in a rural area. And we're seeing fewer women who are able to stay home to take care of the family as they did because of the options of being in professions or having jobs and contributing to the workforce. So we have to, in, in spe thinking of government programs for support, for housing, and for general health services, really need to think about uh, uh, investing, gender investing in gender responsive programs and services for older people, not only for their care, but to help them stay alive and active. And I can say that as one that's moving into that population, I hope they will put into place many more programs to help those of my ilk who are getting there soon. But as thinking about these, and I've sort of gone through these very quickly because I'm sure they're familiar to you, the thought is from our perspective, because it's the National Institutes of Health, which is the major funder, federal funder of of biomedical and behavioral research. We see research as being important to help us understand better the problems and how to overcome them, and especially in dealing with some of these issues uh, of the urban slum and their conditions and their impact on the health of women. And again, disaggregation of data is vital. We talk about that in terms of looking in global health where we need to, not only in this country, but around the world, to have more data on differences and similarities in health status, health outcomes, in housing, and other benefits for women and men. So we need to disaggregate the data based on sex, but we also need to disaggregate the data looking at other, other factors that influence the health and health status, including urban and rural and looking at other factors that are there. Disaggregation is a key word that I think you'll hear from me and you'll hear from others and that hopefully you have been using. So sort of to summarize where we are and going forward, I said we wouldn't talk that much about where we are and I just spent half of my talk talking about it, but hopefully now I can talk about moving forward. What do these perspectives mean in terms of NIH? Well, it means that NIH itself overall needs to elevate, and in fact, we've seen that with the word of the director of NIH, to, uh, to elevate urbanization and women's health on the global research agenda uh, and to promote multi-sectoral and participatory, participatory interventions. But what does it mean for the Office of Research on Women's Health and for women's health research? Obviously, we have and we will continue to incorporate an emphasis on urbanization and globalization in the research agenda for women's health for the next decade, focusing, of course, on lifespan issues. We need to give attention to the priorities that are being identified through our strategic planning process uh, and how we can address and what we need to do to address some of the health issues for women. And of course, how to create that synergy, some of which I think interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches help to accomplish across all the range of disease-specific interests, not only in domestic health research, but in international health research. So the bottom line for us is that we feel that there is a need to and that we must utilize biomedical and behavioral research to eliminate our gaps in knowledge so that we are better prepared to address inequities in the prevention, detection, treatment of illnesses among women of all races, all cultures, all ages in diverse environmental and geographic settings, and especially those who are affected by poverty and many other factors. Well, at the UC San Francisco meeting, we had a working group on global health, and it was chaired by, uh, by not only members of the extramural community, but we had NIH co-chairs, as well as scientific writers, to come up with recommendations related to women's global health. I thought it was important to point out how this group approached its, its, uh, approached its agenda setting uh, in the area of global health. And they began by reviewing disparities in disease and injury in, in the, across the lifespan for women in developing countries and, and developed countries, beginning in utero and ending in old age, reflecting our concept of what lifespan is. And then looking at 
gender disparities in health risks, health needs, and organization of health care. I highlighted some of the areas that were particularly acute, such as maternal mortality and, and mortal, maternal, maternal disability, and also took, a, took note of some of the health conditions that most often affect women in developing countries. Uh, but, uh, and I, I think they had actually said that that only affect women. We know that we even see female genital mutilation in this country. You can't just say it's in, in other countries. We see it in many places and looking at many other in things that impact on the health of women. Well, these are draft recommendations because we haven't finalized the report, but I want to give you an idea of some of the things that we will be hopefully taking forward. First, to support translational research. We do all the research. We fund the research. Does it get to the people who need it? That's what we need by increasing the translation research or translational research to make sure that what results and what we learn from research can actually be, uh, be applied as interventions uh, in countries and in the U.S. as well as around the world to improve women's health, particularly when it comes to reducing maternal morbidity, morbidity and mortality. And it was recommended that we should focus our research programs and, and our priorities for research on preventive strategies that aim to reduce the risk for reproductive, chronic, and chronic diseases keeps coming up as being very important, as well as infectious diseases, as well as development of standards of practice for how to conduct culturally sensitive research, as well as culturally sensitive, gender sensitive healthcare delivery. Looking at sexual and reproductive health, I think we've covered that. I mentioned that, and I'm sure you're familiar with all of this, but at least it was pointed out and is a major area uh, of, of, of priority that was brought to us from this particular working group. Looking at how to prevent chronic disease, another important area, looking at the contribution of biological, environmental, behavioral, and physical factors that contribute to or can protect from the development of chronic diseases because it's those chronic diseases that really affect the community, can really affect the, the socioeconomic status, and really affect the ability to function and work, and be a caregiver or need care uh, for women themselves. Uh, and of course, in infectious diseases, recognizing there are many other areas of infectious disease beyond just HIV, HPV, and sexually transmitted diseases and malaria that we hear most about, but to really be able to utilize our basic science pathways as well as behavioral and, and other hormonal changes of women across the lifespan to help us learn more about how to better prevent and to treat, uh, and really prevention is key, as well as to treat and cure these diseases. Um, and capacity building, this is the last of the major recommendation categories. Capacity building is extremely important. Uh, in making sure that we have individuals who are trained, who are prepared to help deal with the problems around the world within their communities. And I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes about some other areas that are developing. But of course, focusing on things like mentoring and research training, development of women as leaders, both within the scientific community as well as within other areas of the community, and having an, a, a supportive institutional environment. And this is so important because as we're looking at career enhancement for women in science and biomedical careers here in the United States, one of the key areas that we're focusing on is changing the institutional environment to make it more receptive to some of the special issues for women in these careers. The same principle applies to really dealing with health issues and career issues around the world. Now, just a few points from the understudied and underrepresented populations, and when we set this working group up, uh, many felt we shouldn't call it, we often call it the special populations. Well, didn't want to be seen as special populations. They felt maybe special would be a nice way to look at it, maybe not. Really wanted to think of these various populations as really more understudied or underrepresented in research populations. And so that was the term we use and that we will be using forward in referring to some of these different populations that need to have more research, more studies done to help improve their health. We divided this big working group into several 
different ones, and one specifically looked at, at some of the underrepresented populations, including those for the poor, urban, or rural populations. And this working group was co-chaired by Vicki Mays and Gloria Sarto, with Lynn Gerber, Pamela Brown, and Celia Maxwell as co-chairs, and of course, representatives from the NIH. Now, sort of their overall statement was that when we look at women and girls in vulnerable societal statuses, a lot to say, uh, including women in urban and rural areas, that there are often unique health concerns in terms of disease risk, incidence, the course of their disease, access to care, and disease-related disability, and that with these populations being underrepresented too often in research, that we need to make sure that our clinical research is addressing these populations. Some of the recommendations that came was, of course, first, we need to increase the participation in our research funded by the NIH so that we can get the information. We will provide the information to fill in some of those gaps in knowledge, to know in what directions public health programs should go, to what direction government programs should focus, what some of the priorities for health care programs should be, uh, and I'll say just a bit about that in a second. But also incorporate considerations of place, space, and context. And I thought that language, I didn't give them that language. I don't tell them. I like to listen. These are all thoughts coming from the group. But in preparing this talk for today, I thought, gee, I like that. I hope you do, because I think it really sort of summarizes many aspects of what we're looking at in terms of global health and that there are similarities as well as differences, but if we think about them in terms of place, space, and context, it can help to give us important direction for how we approach that, that public health, that prevention, and that, uh, that wellness for those different populations. And again, another reference to disaggregation of data. That trauma, trauma kept coming up over and over, not only in these several working groups, but in other working groups, but in, in dealing with poor or, or urban populations, trauma kept coming up as a major area to focus on, as well as to focus within our research agenda on some of the biopsychosocial factors uh, that encompass the role of trauma on health outcomes. Improving health communication and literacy, as we look around the world and look at different areas, even if we look across this country, within different communities, different cultures, we need not one form of communication works well for every area. And so we need to tailor our thoughts about how to communicate what we know about health and wellness, how to communicate those results of research so that there can be the utmost benefit. And of course, one of those is really looking to utilize existing social networks for utilizing health information. And that in itself could be another whole talk. Well, those were some of the major recommendations from that group. And, and I want to just say a bit about, because I've been talking about including these populations in studies. And of course, I'm speaking from the NIH. You've got funding of research around the world from different organizations, different foundations. But one specific issue related to the NIH policy for the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research, and that is the language that we use. When the office was established, recall, it was established to ensure that women would be included in clinical studies funded by the NIH. And so we put in place a policy requiring the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical studies. But in 1993, our U.S. Congress passed a law, so it is now a matter of public law as part of the NIH Revitalization Act that NIH must have a policy that requires the inclusion of women and minorities in studies uh, of conditions that affect those populations. And by having this in law, it helps us to enforce this requirement and require investigators to do that. Now, just a couple of things about our policy. First of all, this law only applies to the NIH, so there's no law that requires industry, that requires foundations, or even some other components of the federal government, if they fund research, to have to require women. It is an NIH-specific law. Secondly, one of the major areas we hear about uh, is that a number of NIH studies are done, are funded, are conducted in countries other than the U.S. And there has been some backlash by investigators saying because these studies are being done outside the U.S., we don't feel we have to adhere to this policy. Those who wrote the law said there are no exclusions to this policy. So what do you do if you're doing a study outside of the country? 
if your identification, obviously, as woman or male, or as, as black or Latino, is self-identification. Well, we don't have the same minority populations called minorities in other countries that you do here, yet they're not exclusions to those policies. So what we have recommended and what is in place is asking that for those who are in other countries, and they're not U.S. citizens in other countries, that they would identify for the matter of our record keeping and meeting our policy as to how they would be classified if they were within the U.S. So. In, in to follow up on that because of some of the concerns, um, we, we have charts that we show both domestic and non-U.S. participants in clinical studies, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. You're addressing issues related to the urban poor and slums and, 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 and whether they're living in urban areas or other areas. We don't have a way with the thousands and thousands of protocols to really track whether the participants in studies are from an urban area or another area or what the economic status is. But that has to be evaluated on the basis of individual studies and individual study design. So it's not overlooked, but I can't show you a chart and show you how many women from urban areas or, or how many women were poor women who participated in studies. But we do recommend that across, that the entire population be represented in the studies. Um, and I should point out that even with the concerns about how one classifies uh, populations, including clinical studies funded by the NIH, if they're not in the U.S., the Fogarty International Center, as do all other NIH components, have the language, in fact, they must have the language because it's required by law uh, that, 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 uh, that sex and gender analyses must be conducted and that these uh, determinations must be made. A little bit about the race ethnicity categories. Uh, you're probably aware of this, but if you're not, just a bit about this. We have to use what the Office of Management and Budget of the federal government indicates we use for classification for ethnicity. I think we're all clear about male, female, although as we're looking at intersex and some of the others, those are questions that have not been dealt with or resolved at this point. But in terms of race ethnicity, we have to use the categories that are used across the entire federal government in the U.S. And so what we see is that everybody has to be, has to determine whether they are Hispanic or not Hispanic, and then either if they're Hispanic or not Hispanic, which racial category they belong in. This becomes quite confusing for some parts of the world, and we recognize that it, it can cause confusion and it has caused a bit of controversy, but the intent was good. The intent of the law was to ensure that all members of the population would benefit from the results of research, but this is an area we're still looking at. And just, just to show you, NIH funds research around the world. We're not the only funders around the world. We're not the only funders in the U.S. But in terms of data for, for NIH-funded studies, you can see, for example, I know this is a complicated chart, but it gets very complicated with, the, with the, what we have to, the record keeping we have to take, and this was the most simplistic way to represent it. But let me just point out that, that we had, looking at clinical research studies that used human subjects, that uh, in 2009, there were almost over 11,000 clinical studies. And of those, about 66 percent were done in the U.S., uh, and then we had a, and I, that figure's got to be wrong, that must be, uh, it says 81 percent, that can't be right. But we can compare the numbers if you come down to numbers enrolled, this is for all clinical research studies, out of over 11 million, that's 11 and a half million women, 11 and a half women only, enrolled in clinical research studies funded by the NIH. And of those, about 6 percent of those women were non-U.S. participants. You can see similarly for males, but it's also interesting to see that while there were almost 11 million, well, 11, over 11 million females, uh, there were about seven, over 7 million males. This often leads to questions about, okay, you're putting women in clinical studies. Are you ignoring and discriminating against men in clinical research? No, we are not, because if you take out gender-specific studies, because if you look, gender-specific studies, it's about equal, 49, 51, 50, 50 percent, because you see more women because we're catching up on studies that were previously done in men, uh, as well, uh, like 
like the use of aspirin for prevention of heart disease, et cetera. But also, you've got the menopause studies, you've got the breast cancer studies, you've got the uh, ovarian cancer studies, you've got puberty studies, you've got menopause, all of those, and those increase the number of women in clinical studies. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that, and here are similar figures. Uh, here are similar figures for looking at phase three clinical studies. More data than I'm sure you want to see, but I just thought you'd like to get some grasp of that. Recognizing that we, but both, uh, in, uh, both NIH investigators from this country carry out research in other countries, but we also fund researchers in other countries. I just thought it would be interesting to get an example of some of the kinds of studies on women that are done in other countries. Here, for example, in China, one looking at risk factors for lung cancer in non-smoking women uh, in uh, Yunnan province in China. Here, suppressing ovarian function uh, using uh, tamoxifen uh, or comparing tamoxifen in postmenopausal women with hormone response of breast cancer in South Africa, uh, here in Mexico, uh, dietary calcium supplementation to reduce blood levels in pregnancy, and another one, safer uh, sex counseling programs for changing sexual risk behaviors in Mexican female sex workers. And I think some of you who've seen the papers in the U.S. are familiar with that because this was a study that the NIH felt was scientifically valid, but there were some who felt that this was an inappropriate use of scientific funds. And wanted to pull the funding, but uh, science prevailed and the study went forward. Uh, we deal with all kinds of issues. And just a little taste of some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the issues looking at breast cancer. It's been said that there is a higher incidence of breast cancer in, in urban areas. I thought it would be interesting to just to see a representation of breast cancer trials around the world. And this was mainly so I could point out to you what many don't know, which is where it used to be if you wanted to know about a clinical trial sponsored by the NIH, you had to go through your doctor, even if you were a doctor yourself, if you were the patient and that doctor would have to call and talk to someone there. Now, anyone can find out what clinical trials are being conducted, where they are, the status, uh, and whether they are completed ongoing by simply going on the web to clinicaltrials.gov, and that information is available. And the kinds of things you can do with that data, like here, looking at studies around the world on breast cancer, looking at cardiovascular trials in urban areas, I'm sure these numbers are lower than actual numbers because to pull it up, it means someone has to have keyed in the word urban. And one of the things we need to do for data collection is to make sure those where studies are being conducted gets keyed in so that we can have better data. Looking at trauma and violence, depression, uh, and of course HIV AIDS, and I know I've talked too long, so I'm pushing through this to get to the last part, uh, but there's special efforts to look at, uh, uh, at HIV-related research priorities uh, for reducing HIV uh, and disparities, especially in the international setting. Uh, and of course Fogarty has a AIDS International Training and Research Program that our office helps to co-fund. And obesity, of course, I can't leave looking at issues of importance for health, for women's health around the world without referring to obesity. And of course, we know that obesity seems to be uh, more, uh, more, more prevalent in urban areas, and maybe that's because of the food that one partakes of. And this is a map uh, showing urbanization and obesity related to NIH research around the world. Just interesting. Well, I pointed out at the beginning that one of the mandates of our office is to address women in biomedical careers, and we have changed that or broadened that concept to recruitment because we want more girls and women to think about going into science. Retention, we don't want to lose them once they get into science careers. For those that have to interrupt their careers because of family responsibilities, we want to provide opportunities for them to re-enter, to come back in so we don't lose them. And we want them to be able to advance into leadership decision-making positions in biomedical careers and in all healthcare professions. Well, I'm not going to say more than that, but as you noticed, or maybe you didn't notice, but at every one of our strategic planning meetings, we've had a working group on women in biomedical careers as well as career advancement. And there was one working group that came up with an acronym that I think will probably, you will probably see again, we're probably going to adapt this as one of our mandates for moving forward. This group came up with addressing women in biomedical careers by saying we should call it Miles Ahead, dealing with mentorship, institutional transformation, leadership, educational pipeline, and support for careers. 
I think that's pretty much what we've been doing, but sometimes you can reinvigorate what you're doing by calling it something different and coming up with new ideas. So I think miles ahead may be what, where we'll be going in terms of the next area. But I wanted to then, aside from that, focus on some of the, the capacity building, which I mentioned a couple of times before, and focusing primarily on programs that the Fogarty has. Now, many of the institutes at NIH have capacity building programs bring investigators from other countries to train them at the NIH, uh, support uh, research development, career development in other countries. But I want to focus primarily on some from the Fogarty Institute, uh, Fogarty Center, I'm sorry, it's the Fogarty, Fogarty International Center, that's what FIC stands for. Now, the Fogarty supports a large range of not only research, but research training programs focusing on the needs of low and middle income countries, dealing with both communicable and non-communicable diseases. And we in our Office of Research on Women's Health, as well as other institutes and centers across the NIH, help to fund or co-fund many of these programs with the Fogarty. This is a new one that was just announced uh, very recently. In fact, I had to ask if this was public information before I put it into the speech. And this is a new collaborative initiative uh, that is aimed at institutions in sub-Saharan African countries that receive PEPFAR support. And the goal is to increase the number of new healthcare workers by 140,000, strengthen the medical education systems uh, in the country, I think that was supposed to be counted, or countries in which they exist, and build clinical and research capacity. So it's really building research capacity in Africa as part of retention faculty, a strategy for faculty of medical schools and clinical professors. Now this is a major initiative, and actually the major dollars from NIH are actually coming from the office of the director, a commitment of Dr. Collins as director of NIH, using his funds to help support it. In addition to that, the, uh, the office of U.S. Global AIDS uh, from PEPFAR, the, uh, the office of AIDS research, our office, and the Fogarty are contributing. And then there are other collaborators from across the NIH, from the Department of Defense, from CDC, uh, and from uh, USAID. This is thought to be a model, and it's one that's just getting underway. The funding just went forward. I think they just tapped my budget for this money uh, a few weeks ago, so I know it's just getting started. But could serve as a model for other new initiatives for global health, because it's interagency and intergovernmental, inter meaning we've got Department of Defense, you've got, you've got Department of State, you've got Department, uh, you've got, the, uh, you've got uh, the NIH, you've got CDC, uh, and that is important, showing that collaborative effort. It has a women and girls-centric approach, it can help enhance models of medical education, perhaps most importantly, it can build clinical and research capacity, and it should be sustainable, and it will be evaluated as almost everything under this administration will be evaluated for its outcomes to see whether or not it was successful. Now, this is a busy slide, but let me just tell you a little bit about the Clinical Research Scholars Program, because I personally have been involved with this, and our office has helped to support it. This is another program that the Fogarty has that pairs a U.S. medical student with graduate students in health sciences from other countries around the world, and they work together as equal partners uh, in, in, in doing research and in both career development and research. Very exciting because I've seen these young people as they come back to the Fogarty in the summertime, they talk about their experiences, and seeing those from other countries interacting with students from our countries, it's just a wealth of, of, of interaction and stimulation and inspiration for those of us who funded and for the students who are there. Another one, because I didn't say much about it, but we know that as we look at global health, we don't talk enough about mental health, which is one of the major contributors to, to issues for women, uh, women's health around the world. And I thought I'd just put this in to point out that here is a, a program sponsored by Fogarty that's called BRAIN, which is to deal with brain disorders in the developing world. And some of the areas related to women that are being addressed are postpartum depression, psychiatric disorders, HIV interface, and, and looking at the effects of, and that's got to be a mistake there, neurotoxins and neurotoxicants, oh yes, in the home and how they can affect the mental health. And I think this is the last one, and I'm winding down, but just another example. It was just difficult. There were so many things to tell you about. I didn't want to overdo it, but some that were really, that I really enjoy being part of or seeing, I wanted to mention to you. And this is one uh, which allows for the re-entry 
We talk about the brain drain from other countries, and this is one to help deal with that because it means that when we have investigators from other countries training at the Fogarty, this program helps facilitate, and this is using reentry in a different way, reentry back into their home countries and home communities to broaden the program and take back what they have learned as a Fogarty and as the NIH to their countries. Uh, and, and, some of the, and, and I thought some of the types of uh, research topics they have addressed are interesting, like the association between widow inheritance and HIV infections. That must be a very fascinating result uh, study. Iron supplementation in HIV-infected women, use of antinatal, antinatal corticosteroids, uh, and of course having studied Kidney was my specialty for many years, looking at the epidemic of Balkan nephropathy in women. Well, the point of this was to point out that Fogarty puts a lot of emphasis on capacity building and sustainability, and looking at the number of Fogarty trainees who then return home to their countries taking back information. And of course, that's not to say we don't, that we don't, because we do learn a lot. <laughs> about not only the cultures but the sciences of other countries. So those eras really should be going both ways because it's really an interchange and exchange of ideas uh, and, and information uh, and advances. But that's how the slide is. And then looking at the success of this so that if you have those who are trained in the U.S. who then go back to their countries, uh, taking back with them what they learned, leaving us enriched here, and then once they get back, spreading out and advancing and increasing the numbers who may be involved in research or involved in the science. Then we then into a second generation, you'd like to think a third and a fourth, but I think just a very important concept. Well, I've given you really sort of an overview. I hope it wasn't too rapid. I hope it wasn't too fast not too confusing and to even just listen to this voice, um, which I had to listen to even if you didn't. Uh, I hope you got the major points I was trying to make. So I want to end it by bringing it back to what we're doing, which is trying to determine where research on women's health and career advancement should go for the next decade, knowing that if you set a research agenda, in fact, before you get to 10 years, after five years, if science is doing anything, it's going to be out of date. And so we all need to approach not just the research agenda for NIH, but also the, the, the considerations about globalization and urbanization on the health of women around the world. We need to think about what have we learned so far, what are some of the new or emerging areas we need to address, should there be a new framework for approaches because while we've made progress in all of these areas, we haven't done everything we should. Is there a different way, a better way to, to structure how we approach these gaps in knowledge, gaps in information, gaps in health? How do we then take this knowledge and make sure that it's not only integrated into health professional education or policymakers or legislators or government officials so that what we do and what we learn from research really gets utilized and incorporated. But to make sure the individual woman or man or her family or her community also understand so they know what to expect, what to expect of government, what to expect of health care, what to expect of housing, what to expect of those community services that will help them, but most of all, to know how to protect herself or himself, uh, their own health related to behavioral changes. And of course, increasing public awareness and consumer education. We're in a new world of informatics. I can't keep up. Everybody's texting and whatever. I tell them to take texting off of my Blackberry. I have a hard, my phone, I have a hard enough time just keeping up with email. But if you want to deal with the young people, I'm now doing podcasts. Some of my relatives said, Vivian, we know you have some staff members because you know, we know you didn't know what podcasts were. And now they got me doing vodcasts. Well, this is the new way of doing things, not just printed information ways to communicate. We've gone beyond the radio, we're doing other things. And as we think about the new technologies and where we're going, how can we incorporate these messages to get them to the people who need to hear the information? And how can we then implement these into public health policies, national policies, worldwide policies that can inform as well as improve not only health care reform in this country, but reform of how health care is delivered, considered, and thought about around the world that will be both women and family friendly. 
And let me end by saying I have to express appreciation to the Fogarty International Center at NIH, Dr. Michael Johnson, who is the deputy director, nice to say because I actually taught him when he was a medical student many years ago, uh, and other members of the Fogarty Center as well as of my staff who helped me pull some of this data who rushed to get the, the summary reports from the strategic planning meetings together so that I would hopefully have something of substance to present to you, and I hope that I please you, Dr. Malays. I tried my best. Thank you very much. <laughs>